Good evening and welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're so pleased to welcome Bill Buford to our At Home with Literati series in support of Dirt, Adventures in Lyon as a chef in training, father and sleuth looking for the secret of French cooking now out in paperback. As I mentioned, as you joined us, the chat is closed, but you may want to keep the chat window open during our event as I will be sharing links to purchase Dirt from Literati Bookstore. Uh, there's also a link to purchase books in the description right below me if you're watching us later on YouTube. But if you're watching live, of course, you can submit questions at any time for the Q&A portion of our event tonight using the Q&A feature available to you. Uh, it's at the bottom of your screen. And I will read a selection of those uh, questions at the conclusion of my conversation with Bill. Uh, as a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup. Uh, if you live in Southeast Michigan or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this month's or this year's or uh, this week's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. And now I'll introduce tonight's author. Bill Buford is the author of Heat and Among the Thugs. He has received a Marshall Scholarship at James Beard Award and the Commune di Roma Premio Sandra Onofri for narrative reportage. For 18 years, Buford lived in England and was the founding editor of the literary magazine Granta and founding publisher of Granta Books. He moved the United, to the United States in 1995 to join The New Yorker where he has been the fiction editor, a staff writer and a regular contributor. In 2008, he moved with his family to Lyon, France and lived there for five years. He was born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, educated at the University of California, Berkeley and King's College, Cambridge, and now lives in New York City with his wife, the wine educator and writer, Jessica Green, and their twin sons. Uh, he can't hear you, but he can sense it through the powers of the internet. So please join me uh, in welcoming Bill Buford into your living rooms. Bill, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, a great pleasure and a privilege to be uh, celebrating the, 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 this is the first celebration of the paperback edition. Wonderful. Dirt. Well, I, uh, it sounds like you're going to start us off with a, a brief reading before we chat a little bit about the book. So uh, if you'd like to, please feel free to take it away. And I'm going to disappear momentarily and I'll come back to talk with you after. Thank you. Uh, this is a, this is my first reading. I realized um, book, you know, pandemic publishing being what it is, <clears throat> I did read the book for the audio edition. Um, and I thought maybe it would be fun to introduce Sylvan. Sylvan um, was the first professional cook that I cooked with when we got to Lyon. I had a lot of trouble getting into a professional kitchen. And finally, I got into a very famous one called Le Mer Brasier. And Sylvain was then called the cuisinier, and he was sort of in charge of the running of the kitchen. And I joined him. Uh, first thing I did was uh, I made um, an amuse bouche, which was a very elaborate amuse bouche made with some slowly stewed chicken thighs and their skins, and some foie gras and a jelly on top. And meanwhile, he was really excited to meet me because I was an American, and like all French chefs, he wanted to get to America. And he was actually unusual. He's um, um, he was 28. Almost everyone in the kitchen was about the same age, late 20s, early 30s, because no one older would have tolerated the pay, which was bad, or the hours, which were extreme. And because no one younger would have had a prestigious enough CV to be a candidate for VNA's team. Matthew VNA is the person who reopened this great institution, La Mer Brasier, which was the heart of what Lyonnais thought about their food and their city and their culture. And this is what I joined was this reopening. And it was a very, very big deal. Um, the restaurant had high ambitions. The cooks had high ambitions. They were a specific type, Michelin cooks. They all had all worked at places with Michelin stars and every one of them aspired one day to be a Michelin star restaurant chef on his own. Sylvan was different because although he had great rigor, 
And he like he would he would never eat the lunch, the staff lunch. He would have an espresso. He he was just always like just always all purpose. But um, he 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 also had something which I'd never seen in a chef before. Uh, this this enormous fantastic smile. Um, you know, it, when he smiled, the skin around his eyes just instantly crinkled into many folds of happiness. And there wasn't a lot of smiling in France. My wife smiles a lot and was regularly taken to task for her evidently irritating cheerfulness. Once when we were having dinner at our local bistro, Potager, a dinner at the, nabel, at the next, a, a, a diner at the next table complained, do you really need to smile so much? But a restaurant kitchen is even more severe. No one smiles there ever except Sylvain. Um, he leads me through different things and I get more and more comfortable and I realize that this is, this, this is someone who's making me feel really very, very happy. I'm, and then we get around to the position of preparing the artichokes. Artichokes are very big in the Leonet kitchen. I thought I knew quite a lot about artichokes. Um, I'd learned about artichokes when I lived and worked in Italy. And um, I, I'd even been to cooking school in the time that I'd been in Lyon and you know, was taught how to prepare my artichokes. As I say here, when we got to artichokes, I said, at least I knew how to prepare an artichoke. And this finally was a relief. Artichokes are Italian. Artichokes weren't new to me. Sylvan was astonished. Really? You can turn an artichoke? You mean cut away the leaves and carve out the heart? Yes, you can do that. Oh, yes. C'est vrai? Y yes, really. I, I wasn't trying to prove that I was more than a novice. I wasn't trying to prove anything. I had worked in Italian restaurants at l'Institut Pocuse, which is the school I went to. I'd actually asked for an artichoke lesson just to confirm that I was basically doing the right thing. Artichokes are important in Lyon. I'd learned that early on. Sylvan conveyed that he was very impressed in that exaggerated theatrical way of a grown up talking to a toddler and said something about my being more schooled than he'd ever realized. He was showing me no question a new respect. This made me uneasy. He set up an impromptu artichoke station. He took a plastic bottle from a shelf above the sink, citric acid powder, and shook some of it into a large bowl of water. He fetched a crate and we got to work. I can't remember what I did. If I try to conjure up my effort, an image comes to mind, but it is of a perfectly turned artichoke. Two to three inches of the stem, gently curved, the heart smoothly symmetrical, looking like a flower. I genuinely felt that I had achieved what I'd intended to do. I hadn't known that it was a failure until I showed it to Sylvain. What I did at the time was this, I made him cry. What I presented evidently was so mutated looking that Sylvan burst out laughing at it and me. He laughed so hard that tears ran down his cheeks. He laughed so hard that he buckled over. Everyone in the kitchen then stopped their tasks and started laughing too, weakly at first because unstoppable laughter is always contagious even if you don't know why, until you then discover why, and with your funny bone suitably warmed up, you too break out into laughter, pointing at the offending object and at the person who made it. Eventually, Sylvan threw my artichoke emphatically into the trash and said, with difficulty, because he was still laughing, that perhaps I wasn't quite ready for turning artichokes. Only one person wasn't laughing. This was Christophe Hubert. Hubert was the executive chef. And thus began my life in a professional kitchen in Lyon. You bring us uh, right to the, the razor's edge of stress uh, involved in, 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 in working at a, at a restaurant with two Michelin stars uh, there. Um, and I do want to get to perhaps a bit of the contrast between working at uh, that restaurant compared to how you started off your first stage, so to speak, that you found, which was working with Bob. 
uh, at, at Bob's uh, boulangerie uh, making bread and Bob couldn't be m- more antithetical to uh, a, a tightly wound executive chef in many ways. Um, but hearing you read, I, I, I think I want to shift my first question to a question about the craft of writing a, a memoir. Um, there's, there's a really uh, maximalist style to, to this book. Um, and I think about a lot of food writing and maybe like memoir, it, memoirs of this type might start with like a preface where, and certainly you start with like this moment of meeting, of literally bumping into Michelle Richard that sort of changes everything. But instead of like doing this, I think gesture that I see a lot in memoirs where you'd say like, this is this, and I'm here, I'm charting out my whole narrative. I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna uproot my life and go to Lyon. I'm gonna uh, look for, or I'm, gonna, I'm gonna work with Michel Richard. He's gonna put me in touch with the people I need to work with in Lyon. I'm gonna go there, I'm gonna do all this and sort of doing this gesture of like, here's why you should read my memoir and, and a chapter before the chapter, we're just on our way. You, we bump into Michel Richard and, and never look back. And I'm just curious as, you know, of course you were a fiction editor uh, and uh, at Granton and at the New Yorker for many years. Um, you know, within 15 pages of this book, you're, you're already extolling, uh, uh, as you're extolling the proper French way to make ratatouille, you're, you're mentioning the quote, languidly lazy, self-consciously, I'm literary prose of M.K. Fisher. Whereas hearing you read, and this whole book is like, I've stumbled into overhearing someone's conversation about this incredible experience they've had and I'm bewitched and I don't need context clues because I'm, I'm already there. And so I'm just wondering, you know, how you, uh, when you're approaching your, your writing process, if you're cognizant of the, of how much it aligns or mirrors with, um, these life experiences themselves, both in heat jumping into just immersing yourself fully in Italian cuisine and, and here in dirt, immersing yourself in French cuisine. Um, and if your drafting process is, is that way. Oof, the drafting process is brutal, um, <laughs> but thank you. You're, 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 those, are, those are very sweet things. Um, and as you're talking, I've never heard my writing described as maximalist. <laughs> which is wonderful. And this is the day that PBS is showing its Ken Burns Hemingway series. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, mean, I like Hemingway, but I thought, you know, he's right. It's pretty mannered, simple, simple. Uh, and I, 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 I benefited from living in England for 20 years and running a literary magazine there. And I, I, I love the English relish of, you know, verbiage. Mm. Um, but I also regard, I think what I got attracted to writing about this stuff was in a little bit like a travel writer, an old fashioned travel writer would get excited about going to a place and you go to a place where no one's been the best kind, I think. And you come back with a story. It's also true of newspaper reporting, but you come back with a story that nobody's heard. So it's a big part of this is the story of this of this world. It's it's. I I love the stories. I love the story of Michel Richard. I love the broken-hearted, weird, angry Sylvan who you know became his dearest person and my protector, uh, and then just turned into this. Oh, he just he turned into a crazy person at one point. I went at one point, and this is one of his more mild things. I I broken off the stems of the artichokes rather than whatever else I was meant to do. I can't remember. I think I wasn't meant to touch those artichokes and I did the wrong one. And so he kind of cornered me in this wall with a big box of artichokes between me and him and then took every artichoke that I'd taken the stem off and just smashed it against the wall. <laughs> smashed it against the wall. Smash, you know, it made, made a green. And that green, you could tell that was what he was imagining he would like to do to my head. <laughs> um, I mean, these are really kind of complicated people and they're full of stories. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I write this stuff for a lot of reasons. Mainly I write it because I, uh, I feel I have a story to tell and it's not one that other people have had. I, I got a really fundamental storyteller impulse. Mm. And um, that probably comes from, you know, the training I was doing is running a literary magazine that did a lot of narrative journalism. 
I mean, among the thugs, I remember, I'm thinking this because Mario Vargas Llosa is on the Hemingway episode tonight, mm -hmm. or, or one of them. And Mario was a friend, is a friend, but he was a friend when I was in London. And um, I, as the, when I was living in, in England, the football crowd trouble, hooliganism was a very big problem. And everybody had their theories and the newspapers would, would glor glorify them or, 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 or you know, be rep repulsed. And I remember I came from a Manchester United Chelsea match and I'd come upstairs because I'd been invited to dinner at Mario's home. And there was, a, there was an historian and there was, it was a very literary dinner. And then I managed to start talking about, you know, I'd, I was still unwashed. And so I'd start talking about my, my day. Uh, Riding in Fulham with Manchester United fans being chased by Chelsea fans, and I just everyone just froze and they didn't they didn't say anything, and it was that very primary storytelling. It was so primary that it took me a long time to start writing because I thought, well, I didn't need to write when I could tell everybody the story. But I think it's a very important impulse to narrative writing is knowing you have a story to tell. Yeah, and I think that's I, I think that's what comes across as well as just like the 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 style you know I, I don't want to say like conversational conversational style i feel like that can could be have connotations to say but it, it just you feel swept up in this and it, it feels much more like storytelling than you know m memoir gives you the sense of like weight and reflection and it's much more like you're you are you are telling these stories um and doing this the sleuthing as the subtitle attests um I, one thing I, I wanted to ask you about and and maybe this will get us into a little bit of the meat of the book or maybe it won't um but is thinking about french training um and and what that means and one of the things that stri strikes me early on in this book is you run into dan barber who's the uh started blue hill uh in manhattan and of course Blue Hill at, at Stone Barn in um, Terrytown. Um, and you ask him about, he has heard of your French project as you're, as you're working with Michelle Richard and, and you're thinking about taking this plunge into, into official French training. And he tells you French training, he declared nothing more important. And my, in my small way, I, in an insane spot of luck, had the chance to eat at Blue Hill at Stone Barns because a, a friend of mine who who uh, I met in Ann Arbor uh, got married there, <laughs> and uh, um, so I went there and 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 you know this is like sort of this epicenter of this sort of local war movement, and you're you're getting a little wooden plate with like a microgreen that was pulled fresh from the garden that day and everything's right there that day, maybe 30 minutes ago 30 minutes ago yeah and then you know the the course menu for the this is like the wedding reception dinner and i had no idea what this place was until i told people later and they're like you had dinner there at a wedding uh yeah like today's farm fresh egg was one of the the courses and it was of course the best egg i've ever had in in my entire life but for for whatever reason that inf inflected my view of of what this movement was this farm to table movement whatever you want to call it for a long time but i never associated it or wouldn't ever think to associate it with french cuisine which to like a dilettante like me meant like beef and heavy gravy or something like that right so that would be my reception of it and as well, you meet all these people who, who in the book who are telling you that Leon is this gastronomic, uh, uh, you know, capital. Uh, you, you write, Dorothy Hamilton tells you it's the gast gastronomic capital of the world. Uh, and you say, yes, I heard that too. She could have been talking to my toddlers. Um, when you're talking to um, uh, another French chef who's trying to tell you about Leon about as being the mares, the mares of cuisine, the mothers of, of cuisine. Um, and so even for you, for someone who, for whom French cooking prefigured in all of your, was always sort of in the back of your mind as you were experiencing what would become heat and everything else. I'm just curious about this disconnect we might have between French cuisine as being disconnected from what we now understand cuisine to be. Whereas if we learn in the book, you know, the, the Leonese had been doing this sort of quote unquote local war stuff all along. I mean, one of the secrets is just that 
eats all all that cuisine is from from right around them. Um, so I'm just curious about like, you know, your sort of not so, sort of not ignorance, but sort of self deprecating lacuna about uh, what Leon represents in cuisine, and also and how that led to your to your desire to explore it, and, and, and also like why is there that disconnect for us to you as someone who's written about it and lived there between what French cuisine is for someone like me. I just think of like stuffed shirts and, and, and all this, you know, production where, whereas it really is through this memoir, we, we, we want a reader really learns how tethered it is to still enduringly to all of cuisine. Um we think about it outside of France and how it's thought about in France, they're really, really very different. Um, and part of that I think is because you know, the, the, the French themselves are so standoffish and when you mispronounce their words, they, gotta, they, correct, they have to correct you. And French chefs, if you ever look at a picture of French chefs, they're always like this. I mean, they're always like this, um, always like that. And like even a family picture, they go, they go like that. It's like, don't get near me, I'm protected. Um, Dan was my first glimpse because Dan was like, if anything, maybe he'd be influenced by Italy and this kind of like the simple cooking with the simple ingredients. And the fact that he said, if you want to be a good cook, you have to be French trained. It came as a complete surprise. Also, he's, this, was a, this was a party that was given because somebody had, Dorothy Hamilton, in fact, had won this big white truffle at an auction. And so she invited everybody around to come to uh, Cesare's place, I'm forgetting his last name right now. Casale, Cesare Casale, uh, where he was, gonna, he was gonna make this truffle for him. So it was a very Italian occasion. And here was Dan wearing a beret uh, and looking like just ridiculously French. Um, but he's right. Uh, you know, I, I, went, I went to France thinking, well, French cooking is all over. And at that time, everyone was talking about Spanish cooking. And, and then it was something else happening in, in the Nordic countries. And somehow that message hadn't reached the French. They were, they were, they were uncritically, enthusiastically embracing their cuisine as the cuisine. But what you do get out of it is a training and the training is, is pretty interesting. It's basically 400 years at some point, I, I would say like, I could date it 1651 when there was a book that was published which was like a declaration of French cooking. But for like, what I said, you know, like 350 years uh, or nearly 400 years, the, the French have seen cooking as essential to their identity and they have thought every generation really long and hard about how to prepare every dish, how to prepare it perfectly, what the variations are. I mean, I was just looking, I'm, 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 writing, I'm writing a piece for the New Yorker this week on um, cooking, poaching eggs in red wine. And I got this very typical, but perfectly ridiculous book. I think it's published in 1907 or something like that, which is the 250 ways of cooking an egg. And the French will expect you to know the 250 ways of cooking an egg. And there are, when you come to the potato, you know, there might be 500 ways of cooking, and they will expect you to know the 500 ways. Um, and that, that, that's, this is four centuries of obsessiveness. And the result is, if you go there and you can kind of survive in it, you do learn, you learn skills. You just learn skills. And the heart of what you're learning, and it's what the heart of the whole Christian training is, is you learn skills that will allow you to go to any kitchen, any French kitchen anywhere and not embarrass it yourself and be able to fit in. Um, and it's really so that the, all these poor workers can be exploited for somebody else. But the, the result is you, you, learn, you learn real skills. I had no idea what Lyon was or what it represented, except that people talked about it as the gastronomic capital of the world, which I thought was perfectly ridiculous. Um, but I was, you're absolutely right. I was amazed at basically it is a kind of it's cooking where you know no food would be more than a day's journey away by foot or horse or cart, um, and so you would get the chickens from from Brest. I mean, it's forty miles. You'd get the pigs from the south. You'd get the amazing cheeses from the mountains. You'd get. Uh, these amazing fish that was it's the heart of the, of the Lena cooking from from like five miles away and 
that cooking has been fashion. You can go all the way back to Rabelais and you see references to dishes that they serve now. Rabelais was a 1500s, 1535, 1545. Uh, and these, these preparations were established then. And that's just, it, it's, it's really on the whole, good, simple, often very fair priced cooking that comes from the area all right, right around it. Uh, and they've been making food like that more or less since, you know, for centuries. Yeah. Um, it's really very Italian um, in many respects. Uh, just, they don't, they don't know how to make pasta, but apart from that. You, you talk about that. You talk about the, the, the Catherine de Medici myth, um, this sense that this uh, French cuisine is derived from Italian cuisine. Of course, there's a lot of apocrypha in there, but um in, in, when you mentioned that early on, you, French you, person. yeah, <laughs> telling a French person that his cuisine has been invented by Italians <laughs> and they go ballistic. Not everybody. <laughs> um, my neighbor's wife, she she said, yeah, I can get that. Whereas her husband said, absolutely not. The people who gave us pizza, what are you talking about? No, absolutely not. Um, they can go. I mean, that's a button to push. And I'm looking forward to this book appearing. I'm sure I'm going to get attacked and all my mistakes will be glaringly displayed on the open but my book is being published in france in october i think and um i'm i you know several of the people i can make fun of in the book are prominent prominent figures and i, I know they're going to come after me um, um but it's it, it, what it you know in, in a nutshell italy had a renaissance we know you know they got these um, you know great works of art, great paintings, great sculptures, great architecture, this whole re, sort of rebirth literature also included the kitchen. And what they did in the kitchen is not, nothing like what they make now, but what they did in the kitchen was magnificent. And that's what the French wanted along with everything else that Italy was doing then. The French, want, the French wanted Italy so much they kept crossing the Alps to try to conquer it. Um, and in fact, you know, Catherine de Medici is, made fun of as like, you know, the person who brought Italian cooking to France, but the per person who brought her to France was uh, her father-in-law, um, the king of France, because he, and he married her to his son, because he, he wanted Italy. So it, when you, when you're there, and Lyon was at one time very, very Italian, it's like, duh, like, duh. And the only reason why it's even an issue is because the French are so chauvinistic. They can't, they're really, it's like my neighbor saying, you mean the people give us pizza? What? They invented French cooking? Pizza? Ow! Oh. Um, and it, it, it's not really not even interesting because it really is so obvious, except it shows you, I don't know, it, for me it shows in little and big ways how cooking, what we eat, what our grandmothers teach us, what we eat with our local ingredients becomes really central to how we think of ourselves as a family, as a people, as a culture, as a nation, as it, it's a very important part of our cultural identity. And, 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 I, and that was interesting, but it's, you know, it's, I, I still looking forward to telling the French. That I, know <laughs> I hope they're kind. Um, but when you mentioned the, the, the Catherine de Medici myth, you, you mentioned that you, you were researching this and then you sort of abandoned the research and you're not much, you sort of, you know, uh, criticize your, your 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 abilities as a scholar, but this book is so filled with such in depth and 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 lyrical lyrically uh, written research, um, getting at sort of the etymologies of 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 the things that you're experiencing, uh, whether it's the biographies of the people you meet or or exactly the kind of history you're just discussing. And I, I'm curious to know what that research process looks like. Is that something you're actively doing um, in those five years? Are you following those impulses at the same time you're following uh, th these impulses that are bringing you to these experiences that are charted throughout these, this book? Is it something that happens afterward and, and the drafting process? Um, the, the drafting process is ugly. I mean, the, you know, it took me a long time to finish the book. Yeah. Partly because I was writing it there. It's hard to write about a place when you're there. Yeah. When every day you go out the door, it's research. I remember- You're I also went, working until two in the morning in some cases. 
some cases. Yes. You know, there was, there was, then I wasn't doing anything except working, but when I wasn't working in a restaurant, I, mean, I remember going outdoors, like, oh, it's a sunny morning. Wow, I don't remember going out. And I suddenly noticed that um, all the buildings right above our house, you have to go up the hill a little bit, were monasteries and, and convents. All of them, like, like mm. just hundreds of them. And they're now homes and they're mainly in neglect, but the, and it, they're all working the land and making the wine and making the cheese. And, and I just went off on a long tangent on that, which led to nothing. But um, no, it was, uh, I, I went there and I thought that's ridiculous that the Italians had anything to do with French cooking and then realized, well, it's ridiculous that everybody ignores it. Uh, and, I, and it was, that was a kind of real time. You know, I, <clears throat> there, there's a French word ragu and there's an Italian word ragu. And I never, could never imagine that the Italian word ragu, uh, and that for me was a little pivot point where Italy had kind of ceded its dominance and uh, French cooking really was taking over. Uh, but that was all real. I, mean, I was like, oh, I'm, oop. I mean, it's like an Italian ragu. Oh no, I need to make it like a French ragu. And then it just, it led to a whole deep, deep dive. I, I go a little deep. Um, it's why I took the book. Oh, when I turned in the book, finally, you know, it was, I have a picture. It was, it, it, it wasn't pretty. Um, and I took it to my publisher, a dear man, very close friend, beloved Sonny Mehta. I finally turned the book in and I turned it. He took the longest time just staring at the, and he said, what the fuck am I gonna do with this? <laughs> Glad I called for a meeting. Um, well, I, I don't, I, I don't think it. You could pare it down any more essentially. Truly, um, that's for sure. Um, I think I just have one more. Of course, I think I just have one more question for you, and, and then I encourage our, our viewers to please submit any questions you have for Bill, and and, and I'll ask them in, in our in our last fifteen minutes or so. Um, I think that we talked a little bit before we went live. That I think. One of the most fascinating points of this book is is the contrast between um, the experiences you have at a, a Michelin twice over starred restaurant and the experiences that you had with um, a baker known uh, mysteriously as Bob, um, who couldn't be more different than an executive chef at, at a powerhouse restaurant and. I'm wondering if you could talk about Bob um, and what you learned there and, and how that kind of forms, at least on the cuisine thread of this book, kind of a, a heart uh, of, of Leonay's uh, cuisine and, and, and food culture in general. Bob, Bob is probably the book is called Dirt. Um, and Bob, I went to Bob when, I, when I'd been rejected by, well, either I was rejected by everyone I asked to work for or the, they, you know, they, they didn't work out. I mean, I did have a couple of references and introductions, but they didn't work out. And so we were, we were there without anything. And I, I went down and asked him if he could t teach me how to make his bread. And um, he, he knew, by then he knew me enough to know that I didn't come to Lyon to hang out in his just disgustingly <laughs> filthy bakery, boulangerie. I mean, just, you've got, you got, there, there's a, a, there's a YouTube clip from a film that I made with the BBC. I think it's called Baking Bread in Lyon. But if, the, 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 the heart of it is just, just the, the, the filth of the place. And then, and then Bob's pulling, you know, loaves out at the last second. And, he, and then he like, something like blows his nose right into the bread. And it's just like, ah, don't do it, don't do it. Aye! He did it, he did it. Um, he, in the wintertime, he, he, he really, I, I, you know, I, I describe him as like a, he had this jolly bearded look, which is, I describe it as sort of an intercross of, genetic intercross of Fred Flintstone and Jackie Gleason, um, which is dating me, but it's, uh, and he, you know, he had the lovely appearance of an old mattress. And he had the same sweater that he would change. I remember doing bread deliveries, uh, it was because when I came back, the, the whole car is full of so much flour 
that I, I, I was wiping flour out of my ear for the, for the rest of the day. Um, but he, 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 believes, he, he believes in the beauty of bread that's properly made. That's not the hard part, but bread that comes from uh, ingredients that haven't been ruined by modern life. Um, and that's not organic and that's not biodynamic. That's something so much more basic. It's like comes from soil that hasn't been ruined by modern life. And it comes from soils that where people have been growing their grains to feed themselves since, you know, since there were people eating grains. Um, and there was something to his bread, which was absolutely unmistakable. And I, 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 I make the point like when, it, when, when Frederick finally learned to love it, my son Frederick, he made a habit of breaking it open and smashing his face into the bread and smelling it. He wasn't even just smelled it. And it became a touchstone. So when it, we got bread on Wednesday, which is when Bob was close to, he would break it and go, ooh, and he would throw it down. And uh, when I finally found some bread on a trip, like a last trip that I, I came after the family and then back after the family. And I, I discovered this bread and I then took it, traced the bread to the miller and then the miller took me to his people and he took me to his, his factory and then, and he liked his flour from all the places where Bob grew his and especially liked the volcanic soil. And I, and I, I brought some of his bread back and I made some bread. And the first thing I did when I got home was Frederick would break it up and he'd stick his nose to it. He recognized it. Um, it it's, it's mainly the, the, a bread that's respected um, as an as a expression of a plant. And it needs to be fresh. Um, and uh, you need to use the flour in a, within a couple of weeks of its being milled. Uh, and principally though, it comes from a, a, a plot of earth where the earth expresses itself in the plant. And that's just unmistakable. And uh, it, was, it was it was a life lesson, and a glimpse into the what's really good about French what's really good about French cooking isn't the cooking so much as like the the stuff, you know these cheeses. It's insane the cheeses you can get in France. I, I regard it as oh, I see you got a cat too. Mine was like realized I hadn't fed, fed them yet, and they were outside the door. Um, yeah. uh, you know, there are like two and a half thousand different kinds of cheeses in France. And they're all have these unique properties. They're all made in the same ways, but they all come from milk. Um, and it's it's almost like they're holding onto it because it's a, these these are like unique expressions of one place and not another. And that's you know the one kind of grass and not another, one kind of earth and not another. Uh, and that's there's poetry in that. There's mm -hmm. like there's something, yeah, you know. Yes, it ties into our climate issues and our modernity issues and pesticides and all those things, but in some fundamental ways, like it's just there. Here's a culture that prides itself in what its patch of earth will produce, and that's what Bob was. Right. Um, a viewer asks, uh, "Are filthy bakeries a thing in France, or was Bob's an outlier?" I have never been in a place filthier than Bob's <laughs> in my life. Um, I mean, the sink. Oh, I mean, you don't, you don't, you know, you, again, you had to make coffee, but you don't, you really don't want to put your hand in there. It just, you just don't. And the couche, which is what they, 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 they wrap, you know, when you make a baguette, you put it in a, in a, in like a layered towel so that it keeps its shape, but it's not going to be constrained. Uh, and the, I, the, I don't, I, they never, I mean, they've never ever, I don't think they've ever been shaken out. They're really just, you know what, it's, this is the place that you mean know, we need you know you need yeast to make to make you know to eat the sugars and flour that make for fermentation that makes your bread all you, you didn't need any no i mean bob didn't add yeast he always used whatever he had left over but the yeast was all over the place i mean all, <laughs> you could just feel it it was just i mean it was i, I just recommend this, this it's just a weird little clip and i'm kind of wandering around looking stupid uh on youtube but it's um you it's 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 no lie most bakers wear white, you know, they, then the, they wear white as part of the same thing that a chef wears a white, white, a, sh a chef's jacket. It's, it, it, it's really a, a commitment to pop being clean and having mm -hmm. order. Mm -hmm. and everything is pop, your, your counter service, your works, everything is pop. Yeah, Bob wears 
black, brown, um, <laughs> um, and there's, there's, he did go on vacation, and someone did go in to clean it once. But it was it was a, the place. There was, it, it is not typical. It's not typical. But maybe it contributed to the flavor. I don't know. Um, there's another question from a viewer, Salma, who writes, uh, Bill, I listened to the Dirt audiobook and enjoyed hearing it in your voice. Uh, how has your time in France changed the way you uh, dine in restaurants now, now meaning pre or post COVID? Um, I think the, the, the way it's affected me most is, it's, uh, is how to think about restaurants. And that's very, that's post COVID as well as pre COVID. Um, you know, there's this, there's this thing. I, wait, why are the French so thin when they eat so much? Like you see a French person at a restaurant, and you know they're 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 eating every they they miss nothing. And then at the end, they want a dessert. They're drinking. If they, oops, sorry, <laughs> my <laughs> my phone suddenly went off. I don't, I don't even know what that is. Um. So, um but they're skinny. And what you learn when you're in Lyon is that most time people make food at home. It usually falls to the woman, admittedly, but not always. Uh, and often it's joint, but it, 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 is, it is home cooked. We lived in a kind of nice old, very nice old apartment building, but it was, a, it was kind of a courtyard. We were like half of the courtyard and had people in the other courtyards in the summertime. When you could open the windows, you would hear everybody's eating at the same time. Everybody's cutleries on the on the plates at the same time. Everybody's scraping the dishes at the same time, and you make food. So when you go to a restaurant, it is a privilege. In the United States, the way restaurants have been folded in with fast food, and fast foods have kind of done their own versions of restaurants. We, 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 the, we it's a convenience as much as it is a, a, a pleasure. But in Lyon, it was an absolute treat. And if you go to a restaurant. You eat everything. You would never see a French person not eat dessert. If you go to the restaurant, even if you don't eat dessert, even if you're weight, if you don't worry about the consequences of sugar, you eat. You eat everything because you are being served. Someone's done the shopping. Someone's made this food for you. Someone's going to clean up afterwards. And this is dining out is just this great privilege. Um, and I hope, you know, when things get back to normal, I hope we won't forget. I'm going to fall back to the normal so quickly, but realize what a privilege it is to go to a restaurant. What a privilege it is to have someone cook food for you and do all that. And if you go, you know, get the dessert. Um, Stephanie asks, after reading your book, I have to ask, is your wife a saint? Uh, there's definitely a, uh, a, a, a growing body of people who are wanting to nominate my wife for sainthood. Um, she will be pleased by that, you know, the question, but she won't be surprised. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Uh, I just had, um, I had lunch with a friend uh, this week, a Frenchman as it happens, and uh, he, he, was, he was enjoying the book, talking about how, how much he enjoyed the book, but he said, oh, that moment, like, who's that, who is that asshole who kept you from where you almost missed the train and that was Michelle Richard, that was a chef. And, and, and then you, you, then you, you were gonna get to France and your wife went there beforehand and got everything set up and you were gonna bring the boys cause you, know, you weren't phased by their being irritable or needy and you're just indifferent. And so it's, I'm a better person to travel with them. And we, we're leaving our home. We don't know how long we're gonna be for, but this is the biggest thing of our life. My wife's arranged a babysitter and a night out and she's got all these foods and she's got, and I missed the flight. And it, I, it's Christmas and you can't get another flight. You can't get another flight. You can't get another flight. And then the next day we have to go to Italy because I got a prize. And so we go to Italy and that, we don't miss that flight. It was completely catastrophic. And then we, thought, we still don't know if our boys are in school and we're rushing back and we get back on the Friday to see if they're in school and there's a snowstorm and the flight is late and the school closes and we got no, as every, they only closes for the holidays. We have no idea even if they are going to school or not. Uh, my wife has definitely been severely tested. By her husband um to this day <laughs> well you saw it i forgot to order it before i forgot i forgot the only thing she wanted to eat was a salad you, you didn't get the salad 
Kirsten writes, um, what is next for you food wise? You went pretty deliberately from uh, Italian to French cooking. Is there a next step? Uh, I don't know yet. Um, I, I do actually have a book about New York that I started writing when I first came here that I would like to finish and I would like to do more. I'd kind of, I would like to actually engage the food culture here at a really sort of nitty gritty level. Uh, apart from that, um, I got this little idea of going, I was thinking about a day of going back to Lyon and working as a, as a chef at uh, Bouchon de Fille, which is our local Bouchon, which is run by women. And it kind of inverts the model of the, of the mayor restaurants, the mayor in Lyon where the, the man was in front and collected all the money and the woman was in the back doing all the work. This is where the women are in front doing all the money and the man is at the kitchen and they treat him like shit. Um, but I, had, I might go back and that would be, um, but I, I have to admit, I, I, I've been thinking the, the first European country I went to and lived in when I first moved to Europe was, in, was Spain. And I, I've, I've been thinking about Spain. I like Spain, so I don't know. I, there might be a Mediterranean trio there. I don't know yet, is, is the answer. I'd be for that. I'd be for the Mediterranean trio. Yeah. Um, Cecilia writes, uh, which out of the dishes you learned in Lyon do you love the most and cook the most now? Um, well, there's a few answers to that. Uh, one is chicken. Uh, and I... I Roasted so many chickens last June, May, June, July, uh, that my sons refused to eat chicken. Um, <laughs> I was looking at all these different techniques and trying to arrive at the technique. And, uh, and there was a breakthrough a week ago, 10 days ago, uh, where without telling them what I was doing, I served them chicken. And George, Frederick, <laughs> largely indifferent, but George said, Wow, it's good. A big breakthrough. But that's like from June till where are we? March, April, April. Um, I think uh, what I've learned more than anything else is uh, I have a I've, I've learned how to have fun making sauces, and there's some classic sauces which you learn. But I've mainly I've I've learned how. The sauce can be quite light. It can sometimes be, well, you know, we were talking earlier about the, the passion fruit vinaigrette, which is actually a kind of sauce. Um, this is a, a vinaigrette that's good for um, endive and bitter winter greens. Uh, that was a New Yorker column that I did. Um, but I, I really, it, it, I, the, the family likes sauces it, for a long time. If I made something and there wasn't a sauce, Frederick would say, et la sauce, who est la sauce? Um, he stopped that now, but he, uh, but it wasn't that long ago. He says, I mean, this last time he said it was, pardon me, I don't, I don't want to sound rude, but is there a sauce? Um, it's a sauce. Uh, the dish I made a lot in Lyon that I'm looking forward to making again and, and have it like, for a long time is a, uh, a basically a duck pie, a tort de um, with a That's the, the dish you mastered at yeah. uh, La Mer, yes? Yeah, yeah. Um, but more than anything else, it's, it's you know, I have a lot of fun. I made a sauce yesterday where, and Fred, I can't have butter, our son. He can't eat dairy. So now it's got more challenging. And the sauces have got more interesting. Uh, I made <laughs> lamb. I made lamb yesterday. So I did it with a Bordeaux sauce and would have done it with bone marrow, but couldn't get any bone marrow, but I did different variations. Um, and there's, I think we have time for, for one last question. And if, if your wants to know, um, do you ever plan to open your own restaurant? Um, but even, and even if not, if so, where and what cuisine? Um, I did think originally of opening a restaurant and um, Michelle Richard, who's a French chef who's living in Washington DC and figures at the beginning of this book, uh, had thoughts of moving to New York. And so I had this fantasy that I'd go to France and then I'd come back and then I'd be trained well enough to maybe start the restaurant with him or with David who, who worked in, who ran his kitchens. 
I mean, in the end, and that would have been ironically the space that I liked um, is two doors from where we ended up moving to and what we where we've just moved from as it happens. But uh, and I went around with Michelle taking to all these little little places, but Michelle liked money and he didn't want little places. He wanted someone in coming in and paying him lots of money and, and that, that, that didn't happen. Um, I did think about doing a pop-up restaurant in Lyon um, and that would be French. I did discover in Lyon that the one real cooking gift that I had, apart from some stuff with sauces, but that the other people didn't have, was I, I, I knew Italian cooking. I knew, I knew Italian pastas and the, the French really, really don't know pasta. They just think of it as baby food and they just pile all kinds of stuff on top of it. It's really, really disgusting. And uh, one of our great dinners in Lyon was inviting these well, actually, inviting these cooks around and then I, they wanted me to make all these different pastas and I made a whole bunch of pastas. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I love the way France and Italy talk to each other. Um, I, I, probably my ideal deal, deal place would be like in Piedmonte in Northwest Italy, where you're kind of right up between France and Italy and, you're, and you can kind of straddle both cultures um, and do a kind of cooking that, that addresses both cultures. Um, yeah. I like it. Bill, you're making me so hungry. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an hour ahead of you, all right? I'm <laughs> no, we're, at, we're in the exact same time. We're at the same time? Oh, that is dinner time. Um, yeah, it is. Um, well, before we go, um, again, just thank you so much for joining us, us tonight. Um, maybe one more question for me uh, you know, home, home chefs are kind of having a moment. Thanks to quarantine. I, I feel like I've learned finally how to season my food properly. Um, as someone who's been both an, an amateur chef and someone who's, who's been, uh, you know, in the, in the, the highest of the high ranks, uh, or among them, um, what advice do you have for, for any uh, people who are uh, trying to improve their chops or maybe afraid of approaching the kitchen even after a, a year of having a chance to do so? Um, it, well, if you're afraid of the kitchen, I think the, the you start simply with proteins. I mean, including just like learning how to make, have fun making omelets. Um, but also any simple protein is fun to cook and not, you know, whether it's a piece of chick chicken breast or a, a, a piece of meat or a piece of fish. Um, and then actually, once you've got that in your saute pan, that's when you can start having fun with it. I suppose one of the big principles I, I came away with from Lyon was don't be afraid of acidity. Um, and acidity, when, when you're like, I went to cooking school and they would say, you do this and this, and you do, you know, pour la city day, and this is pour la city day, this is pour la city day, this is the city day, la city day. It's, um, they, and it's in their wines too. Like, if you drink a, a California red wine, it's like got lots of fruit and alcohol and energy. And boo. Remember, there's a, there a place that used to sell big California wines. My wife and I were there at the bar, and then these stockbrokers came in with all the, you know, this, all the clothes and stuff like that. They, they, they have these knockbacks and some big California capital. Bah! They go, Bah! <laughs> um, but a French wine at its best is combining fruit and acidity and the, the food is the same thing. Um, and I came away with, my boys came away with a love for vinegar. And I remember when we left for France, they'd sm smell my cooking with vinegar and they go, ew. And when they came, now they say, oh, I smell vinegar, what's for dinner? Um, and just mix, mixing vinegar with fruit, taste something, you know, is it, is it a little bite? I, um, you know, so if you make that little protein in your pan, you can make a really simple sauce by, uh, pouring a bit of wine in there and let it, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, you can throw some garlic, you can throw some mushrooms in, uh, and then you taste it. You can maybe whip in some mustard and taste it, maybe tiny bit of vinegar. And then you have a, have a thing that's, it's kind of made with the juices of the protein that you've made. And the great thing about sauces in the French tradition is they, they're really made to enhance the protein. They at the service of the protein. And um, they make, they're, they're a nice, they're a nice joyful element in our cooking. That's great. No, that's, that's truly what I've discovered too, is 
experimenting something I was afraid of doing. And then it becomes really easy once you get started. Um, Bill, thank you so much for joining us at At Home with Literati. Uh, I think we've thoroughly whetted everyone's appetites and we can send them off to dinner now. Uh, I hope we can have you in the store um, sometime soon for the next book. Um, but until then, uh, please stay safe and be well. And, and uh, we'll, we'll see you when we can host you in the store. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us as well. And you can buy Dirt in paperback at the link in the chat, or if you're watching us later on YouTube, it's right in the description below. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. So take care all and have a great night. Thank you very much. Re really a great, great pleasure. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in your bookshop. Thank you, thank you. Take care. Right, good night, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Have a good night.